Big winner so far, Rosillo. The Knicks. So they get OG and Anobi and Precious and Boyan Bogdanovich and Alec Burks, and they don't have to touch their picks and they don't have to give up anyone basically in their top three if you think Robinson's the third most important guy they had. Uh, th- just getting this for Bogdanovich, they traded Grimes and Fournier and Flynn and two second round picks for Bogdanovich and Burks. What an awesome trade. And they still have all their first left. What was your reaction? Well, it's a no-brainer because you're just adding extra guys. Like, I've always liked Bogdanovich. He's 40% from three. He was really good last year. Um, he's just an incredible shooter, and he's got a lot of size. But In some playoff it's experience. Yeah, right. Like, that Pacer series, he was the number one option against the Celtics years ago. And you were yeah. like, okay, you guys, you guys probably aren't going to win this series if Bogdanovich is the number one option. But he's just a better offensive player than any piece that they've moved out here. Uh, here's my question for you, though. Do you think he closes in a Tibbs lineup in a playoff game? So I was trying to figure that out. I went to the game Saturday night when they had a bunch of injuries, and it was so clear that it's like Brunson needed help and maybe another a second creator. So I, Bogdanovich is perfect for that. So if we went Brunson, Rundle, R- Brunson, Randall, OG, which just marked those three in with a big guy, then it's Bogdanovich or, or or Dante as the fifth, right? Depending on what the matchup is, which is pretty nice flexibility. I mean, the big thing for me is when Brunson's off the court now, they have somebody they can run the offense through. And that was the one thing they were missing with the quickly trade, which turned out to be a great trade. But they can, they can run two six-minute stretches in each half through Bogdanovich and, and be pretty good. I'm really high on him. I Did you watch the Celtics-Pistons game this year when the Pistons almost ended their home streak and they were running yeah. everything through him and Cade in the fourth quarter. The Celtics have always had problems with him. Like he's, I don't know what it is, but he always likes going against them. So um, if the big picture, you're the Celtics are the team you need to beat, he's going to help. Thought I liked it. I thought it was a really good trade. And they also kept all their first for if Mitchell decides this summer, like, Hey, thanks Cleveland. Uh, it's time for me to go. And then they'll have he's been- there. Look, he's been on fire too. I mean, in, in January, I think he was what, 46% from three the whole time. So, you know, when you look at the full Bogdanovich package, it's not a ton of rebounds, it's not a ton of like assists necessarily, but the shooting has just held up his entire career. And he's also older than people realize too. Like, I think he's what, 35 in April because he didn't come over right away when he was drafted. So he yeah. got in the league later. But then you look at, you know, granted, he missed time this year, but. <laughs> With with Detroit, clearly he was going to get more options than he was going to get with New York. But I do wonder defensively, even with his shooting, and I think you're totally on point with the Brunson of like, hey, can somebody else be some kind of like offensive release valve for me if yeah. things get bogged down or depending on the staggered rotations and, and how they, they want to run the offense. But knowing Tibbs, when I think about like DiVincenzo and Hart defensively as options in a playoff game, if I like I just had this image in my head of Bogdanovich watching it. <laughs> right. Well, I will say for him, we've seen like remember he had that one stretch when he was actually like half decent going against LeBron defensively. It wasn't like it is the disaster it would have seemed on paper. Like he at least tries. I think Tibbs, you know, Fournier Tibbs is just like, I'm out. Like the game I went to out. last weekend. Right. It's it's and not even all those that. injuries right. and Tibbs is like, I'm still not playing Fournier. Fuck off. I can't handle <laughs> They want guys who are at least going to try on defense. So, um, I, you know, he's got size. There's certain people you can throw him on. He's not going to be able to stop the, like, Luca, but, not, you know, not well, many guys he's, are. He's been a net negative almost his entire career defensively. So, you know, yeah. depending on if you think of it as a size matchup. And look, between OG but he's not a, he's not and a the sieve, big. though, I guess is my point. He can at least, like, he's got size. He knows where to go, and he's not. You know, teams will hunt him, but it's not like, oh my God, we have to get this guy off the court. I don't think he's that bad. No, I don't. I'm just thinking, the only reason I'm even asking this is because of tips. Like, yeah. That's the only reason. The, the trade is a slam dunk. They yeah. Now, when you think about offensive options in the second unit stuff, if they want to go that way with him, and the way DiVincenzo's played out of his mind, and it feels like Hart just kind of impacts games. Yeah, uh, just a bunch of different ways. And you probably felt like Hart and Grimes were a little redundant anyway. So 
it's it's a no brainer considering what they gave up. And I think the best part about Bogdanovich, which, you know, I think at some point we should talk about like the Philly part of this is Philly was rumored to be in play for him. But I think the Embiid injury changes probably a lot of like Maury's options. And then you got to figure out like, OK, what could the projected cap space be for Philadelphia and all this stuff? The fact that Bogdanovich is 19 million next year. And I know it's not even fully guaranteed. And locked it's in million. next year. Yeah. Right. But you'd have to think that Bogdanovich at 19 million versus what you'd be spending for that kind of player, even at an advanced age, it could be more than 19 million and you'd be extending it for probably three years. So there's a lot of cost certainty there where I'd be shocked if he's not like, I don't think they're just going to do the 2 million and then make him a free agent. I would think that this is, but they have that option if they want to, but I still think that's a really good number for what he provides. Well, remember, we would talk about this when we did the Sunday pods, how the Celtics were in that stretch of a couple of years where they never had the right contract for trades. It was always like they had giant contracts and small contracts and nothing in the middle. So the Knicks had this Fournier contract that they had to move before the deadline because it's a trade chip. You got to turn it into a player. You're going to lose it at the end of the year. They turn it into Bogdanovich, but it's also a trade chip next year for them, right? Worst case scenario, it's an expiring a year from now. Um, and somebody that can help them and some, you know, in down the stretch in the playoff games. And then they get Burks out of it. I'm not a huge Burks fan. I just, I, I, I've never been like, oh man, I wish we had Alec Burks. Really? I kind of like I've never him. been a, I've never been a huge fan, but he is shooting 40% from three this year. Now he's playing on this shit Pistons team and whatever. None of the games have been anything, but you know, if you're replacing Grimes, Dante's getting most of those minutes and heart like Grimes was completely expendable for them. And they, they at least have somebody they can put in the corner who can make some threes. And I don't know. So you like him more than I do, I guess. I just always have felt like Alex Burks has had these, these moments where you're like, this guy can score. Yeah. He, he just, I, I think he's had a lot of stretches and granted he's been on what, six teams now that well, he's been, no, he's been, he's been, Utah, um, Cleveland, Sacramento, Golden State, Philly, New York. Seven. New York again. And by Detroit, the way, he was so on, he was already on the Knicks in 21 and 22. That's when I liked him too. I, look, yeah. I'm not telling you, Alec Burks, you're going to be running plays for him at any point in the playoffs. I'm not saying any of those things, but, you know, there's just certain guys that just seem to always get some buckets. And he'll yeah. have, he, throughout his entire career, when I've watched, I'll be like, you know what? That guy's got like a nice mid range turnaround. So, if he's in this deal, I can only imagine Monty Williams going, "You guys are killing me." <laughs> right. are my, you know, how am I supposed to? How am I supposed to get the fifteen wins? Well, they traded um, like five threes a game, and they traded like almost thirty three points of of offense. The good, the, good. The That's thing what they should have been doing this year. Yeah, and they're bad, and now that now they're almost guaranteed to be a bottom four team. Burke says your ninth or tenth guy is fine. That's what I, I still mean. feel like right. they need one more big dude. And I'll be interested to see. I, I kept hearing Nick Richards with them, who I really like, and I think could be an interesting uh, deadline piece. We'll see if he goes today. But I still want them to get a little more size. Big picture, though. And I can't wait to make fun of Detroit, but we'll hold that thought. Big picture, like, you know, I've been worried about this Knicks team from a Celtics fan standpoint. And now you look at their top, their top nine or their top 10 is basically Brunson, Rando, OG, Hart, DDV, Bogdanovich, Hartenstein and Robinson when Robinson comes back as the center combo and Precious. And then Burks is the 10th. And that's a team that could hang with the Celtics in the playoff series. Like it is. And they're going to be tough and they're going to be hard to go through. They're going to be really good at home. They have a closer. They have OG to throw at Tatum. Um, they have some size stuff that I think would be a little bit of an issue if Porzingis is healthy for that series. But for the most part, they got a two seed and they didn't have to see the Celtics till the Eastern Finals. I think it's a legit threat. I really do. I'm not, I'm, I, like, I, this, things that worry me about the Celtics team are the coaching stuff, the depth, uh, the Porzingis injury potential, and then the stuff that happens in the last five minutes of the game and the decision making. And this is the type of team that I would be afraid of for them. Am I am I too panicky? Maybe a little. I mean, don't don't you think it'd still be surprising if this Knicks team were in the NBA Finals? Yeah, but I I, I don't love anyone in the East. I mean, the Celtics have like a five game lead in the East, and Cleveland is now the basically the closest team to them. And I, I yeah, I they're just, the two seed. 
Nobody talks about them. I mean, they, they found a way to stay above water here and not just above water, win every single game while all those guys were out. And now all the guys are back. And, you know, I, I'm still stung from that Knicks series with them last year where I'm like, they're just going to have too much firepower for them. And it's like, nope, actually, their offense is going to look terrible. Right. It's going to look like Mobley and Allen actually in a playoff series. It's just too many non-scorers out there, depending on who the fifth guy is after Garland and, and Mitchell. And yet, Cleveland, like all this love that we're giving New York, Cleveland didn't even have two of their most important four players and still did this. And I you know, I, I hate the kind of like, oh, you need to do this more. You need to talk about them more. But they're the two seed. But I think we're all really just stung. It's all like TBD with them because of that Knicks series. Well, both of us felt like, what is this team? What's their identity? Mitchell Garland, let's figure that out. Mobley Allen, can they play together? And then those two guys went out. And they kind of settled into some identity that I, I just feel like they hadn't found before. Now it's clearly Mitchell's team. So the other guys come back. They have to fit into that. And Allen got unleashed. And now it's like, all right, Mobley, anything you give us is a bonus. But really, he's been great niche. since he's been back. Yeah, he's been good. So the little pressure's off on him. But yeah, that team's interesting. If I had, if you had to rank the Celtics competitors, would you still have the Bucks first? Yeah. And who would you have second with the, with the Embiid in question here? The Knicks. And yeah, Cavs I think the Knicks, fourth, Philly fifth? The, I can't get over that Knicks-Cavs series. You know, if they didn't play each other last year <laughs> right. and the Knicks got eliminated by somebody else, then yeah. I'd be sitting here going, hey, we've seen Mitchell have insane playoff runs. You know, but Brunson shatters through any limitation you ever put on him. But when it comes to regular season playoff stuff, like even when we get out to the Western part of this thing, I just have a hard time buying into something that I've never really seen be successful in the playoffs before. And even with Milwaukee having, you know, the doc record since he's been hired, like Ooh. come in, it's going to take a little time. But they have, for a team with that kind of record, I can't remember ever watching a team that has that great of a record that has a moment once every 10 days where you're like, what the hell is wrong with you guys? And right. yet, because I've seen what Giannis is capable of doing, that... I, I still have a hard time sitting here being like, yeah, I think I'll pick the Knicks in seven against the Bucks. Would you? Would you pick him like right now? Are you picking the Knicks against the I don't the like Bucks Milwaukee at all. Like at all. I, I, to so me, you'd pick the Knicks? I would pick the Knicks against, against the Bucks, yeah, at this point. Until the Bucks can show us they can play well for like three weeks in a row. I mean, to me, their record, I've, I've personally watched them steal six, seven games where you're like, how the fuck did they just win that game? <laughs> they played like crap, but they don't even seem happy after. But they look like one of those NFL teams, you know, like the Vikings two years ago when the Vikings were like 13 and four and we're all like, eh, no way. This is not a 13 yeah, but and the four Vi team. The Vikings had never done it before. Like you're talking about how did they pull out some of those close games? I've watched some of those games too. It's because then Giannis is like this unsolvable thing. And so when I yeah. think about the playoff series and you're like, is, is Can New he York just be unsolvable way? four times right. out of seven? I, yeah. I don't like when teams every couple of weeks just lose by 30 or fall behind by 35. <laughs> it's, it's like the worst sign in the NBA when you can't make it two weeks without like getting just annihilated by somebody. Makes me nervous. I'm not telling, look, I'm not telling you you're wrong on that one because I'll, you know, there's certain nights you're sitting there on league pass, you just go, wait, what's the Bucks score? And then every now <laughs> right. and then you check the standings again, you go, this, wait, this they're 30 incredible. And 16? <laughs> what, how did this happen? Uh, so the Knicks, Incredible front office maneuvering here. And on top of it, they proved one of my favorite adages, when in doubt, trade with the dumbest team in the league. And I guess the question is, is Detroit, have they been the dumbest team in the league for at least a few months or maybe even longer than that? And are they clearly the dumbest team in the league now? Because I think they are. I, I just refuse to believe that trading Bogdanovich and Burks, the best you could do is Quentin Grimes and like a second round pick. That's that was what those guys were worth. I don't see it, but I, I don't agree with really anything they do. I mean, you go back to last summer, like even that Marvin Bagley contract where we were like, wait, that was like three years. That wasn't just like a one year deal with a team option for a second one. The Monty Williams for 80 million, like everything they do, I disagree with what they did to Jaden Ivey this year. Like there's a reason their record sucks. There's a reason. Uh, I don't feel good about their future. There's a reason they're probably going to blow it up after the year and bring in a whole new bunch of people. But this, if I was a Pistons fan, I'd be like, why are we letting these guys even trade? 
these guys just shouldn't be allowed to trade. Let's just, let's take it to the summer and start over with a, with an actual vision. I don't get it. The Monty Williams thing is one of the dumbest decisions I've seen from a team in years. So it's not just this year. It yeah. There's certain things when you look at the roster construction where you're like, what's going on? But then there's also some players that they've drafted that I really liked. So I don't think it's as if, like, they were so high on Duran and they were right. They were right yeah. about it. Um, I think there's a chance they may even have taken him instead of Ivy and then they were able to trade back in and then get Duran and... Whenever you have to hire a coach as like the headline thing, and you know, it's not even knocking Monty, but like if you're paying Monty more than anyone's ever been paid to be a head coach, that should be somebody in the room going, wait, what are we doing? Right. Like, do it's, we wait? It's it's not Eric Spolstra. Yeah. What just to just to be clear, and then when you pay a coach that much, he has l- even less interest in the development part of it. Yeah. Because you know, that's the the circular thing that will happen for as long as basketball exists. The front office loves all the young guys they've drafted. They've scattered. They put all of this time into evaluating these guys. You get that one pick, you take them, and it's like, okay, cool. And obviously, they loved him enough to even take the guy. And the coach is like, well, I don't want to lose all the time. And so with Monty having this much money and this much power and this length of contract, he's like, I don't really have to prove myself to the front office because I'm I'm the most powerful yeah, guy in the organization. I'm not going anywhere. And, right. And so there were so many moments this year. I'm like, what are they doing with this closing rotation? So, you know, this the year. The Ivy thing was, was nuts. And now nuts. you see the way he's playing the last six, seven weeks. Like, the, it, it's just, everything was nuts. I don't, so the, uh, the Knicks right now are third on FanDuel for Eastern Conference odds. Seven to one. Milwaukee's plus 220 and Boston is plus 130. The Cavs are nine to one and that's been climbing. And the Heat are still 18 to 1. And Detroit is infinity to 1 because they're probably going to... I don't even know if they're the worst team because we've had such a nadir of bad teams this year. But they just lost 32 points. I assume now this is the Cunningham Ivy show for them. But but that's what it should under, be. And it should, it, it yeah. should be one more year of between Duran, Ivy, and Cunningham. What do we have? That should yeah. be the main goal next year. Not, hey, Killian hasn't made a shot in four years. So <laughs> let's run let's, the offense room again. Let, right. Let's let's do that. Uh, you, clearly, by the way, I spacing. saw when when that story leaked that Killian is feeling like maybe he needs a new team or whatever that was. I was like, this is the most Rosillo story of the year. Killian Hayes being like, maybe trade me to somewhere where I could get, get a better look. It's that like, happens done nothing though. for four years. You should be in the G League. That happens a lot, though, when the guys of rookie contracts are coming up and they're just thinking, like, I've got all these minutes. I've had all these shot opportunities. So, like, yeah. what's my next contract going to look like? So then you'll see, like, there's sometimes I think teams get rid of guys that they don't even want to get rid of, but the coach won't play them anyway. But in this case, he was playing most yeah. of the time. So they have to figure out who they are with these these lottery picks. I think Stewart's been terrific for him, or he's somebody else the teams would want. But they it felt, look, you can't just have minimum rookie scale guys and then get to the cap or the salary minimum. And it, there, there is value of having veterans around. I'm not into the idea that everybody's supposed to be 20, 21 years old and the entire team when you're rebuilding because you need to have guys that accept their roles and everything. But the most important thing is the resources that you've used on these top draft picks. And it felt like for a good chunk of the season, Monty Williams just wasn't super interested in that. I don't know. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> 